So I think that pretty much wraps up the housekeeping side of things. And I'd now like to throw to Igor to um, introduce himself and um, Emily. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Alistair. And thank you all for joining us here uh, today for this uh, Mango's Mapping and Emlet webinar. Um, so my name is Igor Berenev. I'm the CEO and co-founder uh, of Emlet. And uh, I'd like to give you a brief introduction into, uh, kind of into our products that we'll be discussing today. Uh, I'll try to uh, keep it very short and um, just let me begin by, uh, by sharing my screen. <laughs> um, so a really brief introduction, uh, kind of why, why we started Emlet and uh, what was the story behind it. Uh, so we started Emlet in 2014 with the idea of making high precision positioning uh, affordable and easy to use. We got our first hands-on experience with some RTK gear at that moment, and um, we were uh, really amazed by how complicated it is, uh, how expensive it is, how uh, difficult it is for people that are maybe not surveyors to have access to this kind of equipment. And what we realized was that it wasn't some kind of um, uh, an inherent property of this technology that it has to be expensive or it has to be complicated. It was rather how uh, it was implemented uh, by in the current products that were on the market. So we were really inspired to build something that will be affordable and easy to use. And um, our first uh, product was just like a small module, which we completely crowdfunded. So we always rolled with the, uh, um, with the funding uh, directly from our customers. So we had no investors, uh, uh, no VCs. Um, and from there, we grew organically. We were we've been delivering better and better solutions for our customers over the years, from modules to uh, to ruggedized receivers and to multi-frequency receivers. Uh, and we also evolved our software throughout the years to better serve uh, our customers. Uh, we've grown exponentially, and we are now uh, almost 100 people uh, on the team. Um, our main products are here. Um, so uh, we ha still have the uh, GNSS modules for, uh, for drones, which we originally started with, but we also have two of our main products, uh, the Rich RS2 Plus and the Rich RX. Uh, the Rich RS2 Plus is, uh, is the main product that we sell. It's uh, a really versatile uh, RTK GNSS receiver. It's a multiband receiver. Um, it's rugged. It has great battery life, so it can work over 20 hours on one charge. It has built-in radios, stellar connectivity. It can log data for static. It can integrate with a lot of different software and hardware. And we're going to speak about this in more details today. And we're going to hear from some uh, of our customers as well. Uh, and uh, recently, we have also introduced the Rich RX. And the Rich RX is um, a really compact receiver. So it's just 250 grams or it's just like a can of soda. Um, it fits in your pocket and uh, the philosophy behind it is to make it as easy uh, as possible. And actually it has zero configurations. So there are no configurations to get wrong. And this is something that uh, our customers that want to roll out this kind of receivers to, um, to field crews really like because it really reduces the amount of training they need to do and reduces the amount of support uh, they have to do for their field crews. Uh, and we are scaling this uh, into very large uh, uh, deployments now. Uh, and the vision is that we, we really hope that at some point, everyone who needs access to high precision positioning, be it on the construction side uh, or in survey, they can have their own receiver, keep it in their truck and uh, be there and ready. We are also seeing surveyors using it as their second GPS. So like a lot of very interesting uh, applications there. Um, so apart from uh, our hardware products, uh, we also provide a lot of different software products for our customers. Uh, and uh, we have a mobile app uh, for data collection uh, in the field, um, a cloud service where you can prepare your projects and export data. Um, and uh, the standard version of this comes for free with all of our devices. And there is also uh, a way to expand this capability. Um, we also provide Amlet Studio, which is again a free of charge product uh, for post-processing data from receivers uh, or from drones uh, and Amlet Caster to uh, connect devices over the internet. Uh, what this allows you to do is to set up your own base, maybe on your office and uh, have the data available to um, 
to the robbers in the field over the internet. Um, so that's it. Um, that's my very, uh, very brief intro uh, to save more time for our valued customers and to give them the opportunity to share more about their experience. Thank you, Alistair. Thanks, Igor. Yeah, that's really awesome. And, and as Igor says, you know, trying to really um, democratize access to precise positioning and enable everyone to be able to access this technology through its simplicity and affordability. And I think that's really recognized through the variety of customers that we see consuming the Emerald products here in Australia. So, um, James, can you just unpin Igor if he's uh, pinned? Um, and what I'd like to do now is to um, introduce um, Jeremy Bovell from Bovell Surveys. And um, Jeremy is a project surveyor based in Western Australia, and he's one of our um, Emlid customers. So Jeremy, please unmute yourself if you're muted. Yep, ready to go. Awesome, thanks mate. Um, so Jeremy, perhaps um, for the benefit of the audience, would you like to describe um, how you use Emlid GNSS as part of your work? Yeah, um, like uh, so around Christmas time, got a uh, with the DJI uh, M3 Enterprise. I um, I wanted it to to tie into GPS, and obviously DJI do their own, but um, uh, it didn't have a rover basically. So I looked around, and um, I mean the Emlid came up, and I'd actually. Um, I'd met some people in Perth that had used them before, and they said they were they rate they raved about them. So I looked into it a bit more, and um, yes, yeah, so I've had the uh, the Reach RS2 Plus um, Basin Rover now for eight months or whatever with the DJI, and um, yeah, pretty easy to use. Hooks up straight away with the with the drone. Um, you know, so small, it's cheap. <laughs> um, you know, and the free software that helps out. So, um, I mean, I'm used to using uh, gear with in red boxes, and it's a little bit more expensive. So, um, the Emlid, that's uh, or the Reach is what I use on site rather than the the red bulky box. So, um, yeah, I can't rate it enough. Yeah, great. And it's interesting. You know, you talk about the difference in price and well, even bulkiness, but you know. Um, What's what's your experience in terms of precision? You know, I often say to customers that this gear is, you know, suspiciously cheap. When you're buying stuff that's, you know, seven to ten times cheaper than stuff in red boxes or yeah. labels, yeah. you know, what's been your experience there? Oh, look, just as just as good as uh, the red box, to be honest. Um, yeah, the accuracy is just as good. You know. Yeah. Have you got have you got a favourite project you'd like to share with us? Any any juicy details you want to share with the audience today? Uh look at the moment I'm on a, a rare earth mine um, up north of uh, what's well, north of Kalgoorlie, so Laverton, um, and I use that once a once a month just to fly the drone for uh, earthworks pickups. Um, I, I mean I'm I'm doing the um, concrete works for the processing plant but that also includes like picking up the earthworks before it's handed over and you know just so I've got a record of it and with the drone works perfectly so um yeah picking up services as well with the with the, the basin rover so um yeah it's easy <laughs> yeah. and any any parting words for our audience like what would you have to say to other people that might be considering adopting Emlid? Uh, you know, it's all it's all win win, really. Um, I, I didn't actually believe that they were so cheap, and I was a little bit skeptical. Um, but once I pulled it out, mucked around with it, you know, I was like, "How come it's how how come it's so much cheaper?" But it works. It does exactly the same. Um, yeah, don't hold back. Just get one. And that, that question you just asked, it's probably one of the most common questions that I get asked too. I was at a webinar last week, uh, sorry, at a, at, a, at a meeting last week and the same question was asked, you know, what are the others doing wrong? And I'm like, well, I, I can't really explain what they're doing wrong, but I can just talk about what Emma's doing right. And um, yeah. So thank you, Jeremy. Um, no problems. Thank you. So we might bounce now to um, Natalie Williams. And Natalie's a surveyor with the Australian Antarctic Division. 
And Natalie first purchased some equipment from us back in 2021 and has come back for more since. Are you there, Natalie? Hi there, Alistair. Yes, um, I'm new to the division. Um, I joined in uh, five, five months ago, but uh, we heard that the amulets were being used by our science team to do some remediation mapping. So these are not um, surveyors, um, but they just needed access to some way to measure what they were doing. Um, and they were happy with them. And then uh, I'm looking for a low cost option um, to do some construction set out down south. I can't be everywhere. Um, I also have red boxes and yellow boxes. But um, the, the idea that you have something inexpensive that's small, um, lightweight, and can can fly so without any um, large batteries that aren't allowed to fly on aircraft. Um, uh, I also think that well, my job probably more more to advise and help train these um, non-surveying staff. Um, it's so far so good. I guess we're still in the early days, in my experience. Sure. And and um, did you learn about Emla genus S receiver simply by? occupying the role at AAD and, and they were in the workplace already? That's right. I'd never heard of them before, um, but yeah. I got shown one that was being used and I went, oh, okay, well, let's investigate a bit further. And I was a bit, oh, I don't know, a bit, this is not real survey equipment. How can it be so cheap? But mm. um, and I think I'm. it's turned my head, I think. Um, I like that it's uh, operated off its own, just any device. So because we're in... Um, unusual environments we need to use styluses and hold gloves and things so they that's an extra plus we don't have to buy another piece of kit to to run it with so that's handy um yeah yeah that's really interesting natalie and have you got any parting words for the audience that might be thinking about emily oh well give it a go um i'm i'm hoping um if something falls off a ship or out of a helicopter, it's a lot less money to, to lose. Um, also, we have just yet to test it in the very cold environments and, and it's waterproofness, but um, I'm confident it's going to be a, a good start in the right direction for us. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly, uh, the I'm, I'm part of a little online group of um, deeply uh, dedicated Emlet users and I recall early in the release of the RS2, one of them uh, stuck an RS2 in the freezer overnight up in Norway, Igor, one of um, our users up there that was testing the cold tolerance for Emlet. How, how did that go? Do you recall the details on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. And like we have plenty of users using them, uh, you know, in, in really cold areas, especially uh, one story comes to my mind. We had researchers going to the Arctic uh, and uh, they sent us feedback that their other GPS refused to work in the in, in the cold conditions they were experiencing, and uh, and the amulet worked, and uh, that was a big sigh of relief. Of course, we test them; we know uh, we know that they work. But you know, when uh, when people are going in such remote places, uh, it's always very stressful, and you really want to hear from them that everything works fine. So, I really hope that. Uh, everything will be uh, great in your expedition and then uh, uh, the omelet receivers will not let you down. Uh, and I'd also like to mention the, uh, I think the battery, uh, the battery life and the battery performance, which is really uh, suited for the cold, first of all, for the cold climate because of the particular battery chemistry that we're using. Uh, it's a really like heavy duty industrial battery. Uh, and it also allows you to work for a very long time without changing this typical like camera uh, batteries which are present in, in other receivers still work for a very long, uh, long period of time without recharging being away from from the base maybe thanks igor i might now, now like to introduce our um third uh, uh special guest for today's webinar robert twin who's a director of applied land systems on the south coast of new south wales and robert also has the distinction of being correct me if i'm wrong the assistant surveyor general for tasmania many moons ago Oh, I was deputy surveyor general down there at one stage, yeah. <laughs> then I moved to Canberra. Mm. So, Robert, how did how did you learn about Emlet GNSS receivers? Uh, look, I um I decided to set up my own business about um uh, fifteen years ago. Uh, I was a registered surveyor and still am. And um, I heard through a, a fellow um, surveyor up in um in this part of New South Wales, and he mentioned uh, that this um a friend of his had uh, 
had a, a I think a, an opportunity to you know, purchase one through him. So I, I spoke with him and um, and went out and had a test and it looked good to me. So I was on a limited budget. I just run my own one man business and uh, it's sort of semi retirement type business in a way. And I didn't want to overcommit with um, with a lot of expensive um, technology. Um, so I'm pretty fussy about what I buy and I thought, well, this is worth it. And I bought um, I bought a couple of emblems. So I've been very pleased with it since. How, how have you been using your Emlet gear, uh, Robert? Well, look, my background is um, is GIS as much as it is surveying, um, sort of surveying first, then GIS. So I, I like to start every job by putting it into a, a GIS, and and I just find that then I'm working coordinates from there on. Um, I'll, I'll put in, I'll drag in whatever free data is around from um, New South Wales, LPI, whatever, and... Um, and then I'll, I, I, that gives me coordinates. I can export those coordinates and read them in as a shape file into the inlet, um, into it, and that's really important. Um, I, uh, having having done that, I, I then uh, I'm mainly doing cadastral work, I guess, although I do a bit of detail work and a bit of drone work. And um, I'll take the um, take those coordinates out in the field, and that'll be my first way of finding out where the monuments are, because that's critical, obviously, for any any cadastral surveyor. Um, that's one use, and then um, then I'll also, where I need to, um, utilise them as for the measuring tool. I mean, under the under the strict requirements of New South Wales LPI and the Bossy, is um, uh, it, it stands up to that. So I'm able to use it to uh, fix a datum where, in fact, the skims marks are not available. Um, I I use it then after I've used the instrument, which I often have to do a, a robotic reflectiveness instrument to, to do some of the survey, cadastral survey work, which is required. Um, and I then use the MLED afterwards to just go out and check the location of, of the, the marks that I put in. Uh, and that just gives me, I guess what my real um, objective there is to use a totally independent approach to, to the positioning so that I, I know that I'm not building on any error that might've previously existed. And um, and that to me gives me the confidence to then leave the leave the work site and know that I've I've put the pegs in the right place. Um, so look, I also use it a bit for controlling actually drone mapping. I, I did a lot of um, photogrammetric control um, in my early survey days, um, and so rather than have a, a put a unit in a drone, I have a couple of drones, but they're they're probably not capable of carrying a, anything very much. One of them is a Mavic Pro, might do it, DJI, but. Um, but I actually, uh, I, I, I made some pre-marks and I put those pre-marks down and I um, I then fixed, fixed those with the emblem and then fly it and then I can control it afterwards and I use the GIS to, to do that as well. So that's, um, they're the main sort of applications, I guess. Yeah, right. So it sounds like Emlet's really delivering on its promise of versatility with your wide range of activities. Absolutely, and integrates with what I've got, which is which is really important and uh, and is cost effective. I I, I concur with what the others are saying. I probably wouldn't have got into it if it had cost much more than it does. Um, right. I'd have just battled on with what I had and, and missed out on on so many opportunities as a result of having bought them. So I'm very pleased with it. Thanks, Robert. And have you got any parting words for anyone else that might be thinking about Emlet as part of their future? Oh, well, stop thinking and go buying. I mean, it, it really is a, if, if I, I, a lot of people are probably into the GNSS stuff anyway. I, I actually wasn't. Um, you know, I got registered in 1978, so it's a little bit, little bit before the time of, of any, any, uh, any satellite-based thing. Although I did do a bit of Doppler work while I was in Tasmania, that was interesting. Spending a week or so on a mountaintop, um, but uh, yeah, so uh, it's just an amazing technology and, and integrated with with a robotic reflectless instrument. You know, you can you can really do everything you need to. So, um, but great, great value, good equipment. The um, I had a couple of little issues initially with with heights particularly, um, but they've, they've been ironed out. And now I'm, I'm I've done some tests. I'm getting really good results. I I can hardly believe I I can go out within five minutes. I can get something within about um, you know ten millimeters. That's that's just astounding to me as a as a, an old time surveyor to be able to do that. So so really yeah. great. Thanks very much. Uh, great to hear from you, um, Robert. Um, now, uh, for our next speaker, Graham Worth, a product manager at 12D Software. Um, so 12D Solutions is a world leading surveying uh, civil and water engineering software company. And Graham, I've got a, I've got a, a, a picture to share uh, and, and you've got a, a story to tell about this, this picture. Is that right? Yeah, um, I'm having trouble with the screen at the moment, but I, you can hear me okay, I'm sure. Um, yes, we can, thank you. The picture, the picture is up now. Your your 
first question, I guess, like everybody else, is how did I learn about um, AMLA GNS receivers? Um, my knowledge of that came through the gentleman you see on the screen there. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of an insight into 12D. 12D um, is an Australian product surveying, and it actually um, is built for surveyors, written by surveyors. So it's it's uh, for construction and, and a lot of other applications. It is, it is a very, very powerful tool. Um, our main survey trainer is this gentleman, and his name is Noel Burton. And he also hails from the Canberra region. Um, and he has actually um, been um, a distributor for uh, yourself, uh, Mangoes Mapim, to um, sell the, the MLED, MLED hardware. And you can see in this photo here, he's holding a pole. He has a tablet. It's a, a small seven-inch tablet um, with a uh, total station 360 prism on top of that, um, and an MLED GNS receiver, GNSS receiver on on the top of that. So the the beauty of this for surveyors using 12D is that is a Windows platform tablet he has on the pole. It runs um, 12D field, which he's running in this exercise here, doing a detail pickup. He can connect you to a total station. And like Natalie, um, our clients and customers, um, they use the, um, the green, orange, yellow, gray, um, all the different varieties of um, instrument. Um, and uh, they um, actually can connect to a total station um, with this um, and they can um, use that prism and then they can also utilize the GPS to call uh, the instrument to that prism, or they can switch to uh, a GNS as receiving um, application within our software to actually stream the um, NMEA string and, and get the positions of the, um, the, the poll using that as well. So it's a, it's a very, very um, versatile um, unit to have the um, the emlid receiver sitting on on that pole as well as the uh, total station prism um, and we're connecting up to all of these different hardwares to actually pick up the positions or set out data uh, that's great I thanks think so. have you got any parting words for the audience today well i i think that the um there's so many uh, gns receivers on the market this, at the moment, and Emlet is a very good one. The thing I like about Noel is he is actually a, a great supporter of um, those that are new to the GNSS receiver market, um, and he's also a great 12D trainer. So, yeah, get in touch with him. Excellent. Thank you very much, Graham. And our final um, guest for today's webinar is uh, Lewis. And Lewis Sweet's a senior engineering surveyor at Mackay Regional Council. And there's the man himself. Lewis, um, our paths have crossed a, a, a fair bit recently at various surveying events. Um, but with, for the benefits of the audience, perhaps you'd like to describe how you guys are leveraging Emlet GNSS uh, for your work. Yeah, so we bought several um, RS units for static work. Uh, we're pretty impressed with them. This by the price point was really good. And then after that, we uh, we decided to get an RX for our construction crews. So before they buried any of their services, they could actually locate them. And um, that's been great because we just use that with the Geoscience Australia Auscores broadcast, which is free. And um, yeah, it's been really fantastic. And we is actually- Is that your favourite project? Uh, no, the favourite project. Well, the I don't really have a favourite project because like it's work. Um, we actually went we went to Emled because one of our expensive uh, receivers got run over by a quad bike and that was quite costly. So we needed a cheap solution or a cheaper solution and Emled provided that with their receivers. So that's how we ended up with several of them is because some kid took one of our uh, yellow receivers out with a quad bike. 
Right, so, excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah, we don't recommend running them over with prob bikes, even at well, the... Well, it uh, wasn't an MLED, so that... You yeah. Know, yeah, oh, so okay. that I pushed think... us onto the MLEDs, yeah. Well, I remember telling Igor how I, I was doing a demo for a survey firm in Brisbane and there was a park on Cordelia Street and I, I sort of like lawn bowled uh, an MLED RS2 <laughs> down the concrete cricket pitch. Yeah. And, and it came to rest at the end of the cricket pitch, had a SIM card in it, and it was connected to SmartNet. And you could hear the dinner as it got a fix, <laughs> like lying on its side at the end of this concrete cricket pitch. And, and Igor reminded me that these are sensitive instruments, and despite their price point, we should treat them with more respect than that. <laughs> and that's why you're not a surveyor, Alistair. That's... <laughs> yeah, that, that just might be possible. So um, having heard from our guests, it's a, an opportunity now for us to um, uh, hear from the audience. Um we're just going to run a quick poll to see um, who in the audience has got experience using uh, MLED hardware. So uh, we should see a poll pop up on your, your screen fairly shortly. Um, so um, we'll just leave it open for five or 10 seconds to give everyone a chance to say yes or no if they're an existing MLED user. We'll just get a, a sense of just how many uh, MLED users we've got amongst us today. And um, once that poll's closed, which should happen any second, um, we should be able to share those results and uh, see what we've got in the way of MLED users in the audience. So uh, keeping in mind, this is our first webinar and it's not just me that's nervous, it's my tech team in the background too. They're probably trying to figure out what's going wrong with sharing these poll results. Um, so uh, just, just to give all the, oh, there we go. So 52%, 52%. <laughs> And 2% of the audience are not too sure if they're MLED users or not yet. Uh, so we might be able to win them over in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, so that's great. Um, if you've got the poll results up on your screen, you can click on close um, to clear them out. And we're going to run another quick poll now. So amongst all of our 52% uh, that are uh, MLED users, um, what are the favourite things that you like most about your MLED receivers? Um, and if you scroll up, if you're on a tablet, uh, I'm on a tablet and I can see that there's a number of uh, different choices there that I can uh, select from. So I like that it's easy to use. Um, there's great support, of course. Um, may repel zombies. Um, yeah. Has anyone done the zombie course? We should make that another poll sometime. There's this really famous uh, zombie course that the School of Surveying at University of Southern Queensland teach. Um, and uh, that's it's an interesting course. It's uh, pretty popular. You have to basically demonstrate your, your competency and awareness of how gene assess systems work by writing a, a survival man, manual for post-zombie apocalypse. Anyway, a little bit off topic, um, just trying to um, buy some time. Not quite the guys on the footy show with their small talk, um, but uh, we should see some results come back fairly shortly in terms of uh, what different people think about their favorite features for their uh, MLED uh, receivers. Oh, the suspense, it's killing me. And while that's, um, oh, here we go. Okay, most popular is affordability, followed closely by easy to use, long battery life, so 16 hours RTK, 22 hours logging static, no more hefting car batteries around to get a decent static session in. 47% for great support, 30% for the active online community. If you haven't checked out the Emlet community forum, you really should. And uh, commendably, 27% of you are interested in the potential for it to repel zombies. Um, so it really is a wonderfully diverse and creative community that we have. And thank you for uh, uh, sharing in our sense of fun today. Um, so what I'm going to do now is share my screen and just run through a few slides um, just to expand. I don't really know the um, depth of experience for the entire audience today. So for some people that might be considering dipping their toes in the GNSS water, um, I'm just going to run through some of the use cases for the um, MLED uh, hardware. And uh, we'll try and rip through this fairly quickly because nobody likes death by PowerPoint in a webinar, least of all me but now I'm on the, the giving and let's see how concise I can be. So RTK surveys, that's one of the ways that you can use uh, MLED hardware. And you can see in this uh, slide that we've got the MLED flow app on, up on someone's uh, um, smart device. And um, so the MLED flow app supports terrestrial surveys to do data collection and set out. And um, MLED hardware is capable of receiving corrections by both its integrated radio and also uh, via NTRIP. So connecting on to um, um, cause networks such as the free Geoscience Australia OzCause network and also commercial networks such as SmartNet. 
And you can also leverage the MLED Caster um, uh, software that MLED provide free for its users um, to broadcast corrections from your own base. And um, that is uh, device agnostic. So you could conceivably broadcast corrections from an MLED base through to um, non MLED rovers if you've got uh, an existing fleet in your workplace and you're seeking to scale. We've actually got one survey firm that upgraded their fleet. And rather than um, replacing their entire fleet of, I don't even know what color those boxes are, but I think it's a blue label. Um, they bought a bunch of blue stuff for their guys on the tools so that they didn't have to change their workflows. Um, but they bought a stack of MLED gear to be bases to broadcast corrections via Entrip simply to reduce the capital investment required to refresh their hardware fleet and to allow them to take advantage of all the constellations that are now available. Um, so figuring out how to use my computer, jumping onto the next slide, which is um, RTK surveys for uh, drones. So aerial surveys, um, you can use the MLED uh, Reach RS2 as a base station. So that's something that my company does when we deliver photogrammetry uh, and LiDAR aerial surveys. So again, you can broadcast corrections to the UAV via NTRIP using MLED Caster or um, um, uh, yeah, I think that's a typo. We definitely can't send um, MLID corrections from your base to your drone via OzCourse and Hexagon SmartNet. Um, but you can broadcast corrections in remote areas where you may not have internet. Um, you can still access NTRIP by making a Wi-Fi connection between your MLID base set up over a known point and your drone controller. So using that direct Wi-Fi connection, you can uh, invoke a local NTRIP set, uh, setting, um, session and broadcast RTK corrections through to your drone. So um, let's just jump into another poll. We love our polls here. Um, who in our audience is using MLED products for drone surveys? It would be interesting to better understand our audience. Alan, I just, uh, while we're waiting for the results, so you don't have to do the small talk, I just like to expand a little bit on the just like how many things you can do with the uh, with the RS2 Plus uh, if you're doing drone mapping that, and you can actually do them at the same time. So you can run uh, your uh, base station for your drone. At the same time, this could be the J base station for another RS2 Plus, which is a rover you're using to place GCPs. And you can uh, then use the Rhinox log from the base station to post process the data from the drone. So you get both the RTK from the drone, but also the PPK from the drone and you can also get the RTK for your GCPs and also PPK for your GCPs. So there are just like all of the things imaginable in drone mapping, you can do them with the uh, with their RS2 classes, no matter if you have internet connectivity or not. Yeah, and I can validate uh, that we've uh, certainly adopted that process internally at Mango's Mapping and, and being um, up towards the, the pointy northeast part of Australia. And um, we also deploy into areas where we just don't have a lot of survey infrastructure close handy. So often we'll go up and create our own mark and set up our RS2 plus on top of that mark, capture or log Rhinex, log our raw data to ultimately coordinate that mark. And once we've been able to coordinate that mark by feeding the data through OzPoz, we can then do all of the PPK for our ground control points and for our drone data. So you can do all of that mobilizing to an environment that you've never been to that has no survey infrastructure spend the day there and come home with all of the data that you need to be able to deliver a survey accurate um, uh, outcome for your customer. So looking at that, we can see that we've got about 16% um, um, of our users who are using MLED GNSS for drone surveys. So um, that's interesting. That's uh, less than I'd anticipated, I've got to admit. Um, but, you know, I also uh, was presenting in, in uh, a room full of surveyors uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, um, you know, uh, Lewis was also presenting in the same conference. And Lewis um, was, during his presentation, you know, asked everyone to stick their hands up uh, to see who amongst the 50, 60 odd surveyors in the room were, were leveraging drone technology as part of their business. And I believe it was only about four that stuck their hands up. So we know that um, not every survey firm is participating in, uh, in, uh, in drone surveys. So moving right along, 
Um, this was something I talked about earlier where we've got one of our customers that's using AMOLED RTK hardware to broadcast a correction to third party rovers. And that way you can create a base station that is accessible by all of your company RTK rovers. And AMOLED Caster doesn't just limit you to one mount point or one base station. I believe that for the free AMOLED Caster product, you can have up to five concurrent base stations operating and up to 10 rovers connected to those services at any one time, which is pretty good for a free service. Um, so those RTK corrections can be broadcast, as we talked about, by AMOLED Caster. And we've also got a customer that is connecting external radios. In their instance, a Satel radio, but it could easily be another brand like Pacific Crest or other brands um, to broadcast a correction to their third-party rovers um, using you know, a 450 megahertz uh, UHF uh, correction. And um, coming back to Graham uh, Worth from 12D's comments earlier on, um, AMOLED integrates neatly with um, data collectors, um, not your you know, green and yellow and blue sort of data collectors, but um, tablets and uh, Windows, ruggedized Windows devices and uh, phones to allow users to um, broadcast their, their RTK corrected position um, to in, into those devices to provide precise positioning for third party surveying and mapping apps, such as microsurveys, Carlson, and um, ArcGIS and 12D, of course. Um, we can also, as Igor's talked about, use the AMLET RS to, to, um, brought, to collect raw data logs from the base and the rover and ultimately allow us to geotag our drone images and process them later in the photogrammetry software with already precise positioning. And you can assign those precise positions and update the EXIF uh, headers in each of those drone images using MLED's uh, free MLED Studio software. And of course, you can update the uh, trajectory of the rover using that Rhinex data too, so that if you've done stop-go surveys, or I think in Australia, we often call it rapid static, um, you can then um, derive your rapid static coordinates. And once again, that workflow is supported for free in MLED Studio. Oh, we're getting to the end of death by PowerPoint now. Um, so uh, you can also, as we've talked about, use AMLED RS2 Plus to log static and coordinate uh, new marks, do our drone PPK processing, stop go surveys. And in the context of um, coordinating an unknown mark, um, a very popular solution with our customer base is to take that Rhinex log and to um, upload it into OzPos. And OzPos will read the Rhinex file, recognize that it's an AMLED reach RS2 uh, data set, um, and um, uh, that uh, there's already an IGS um, calibration file published for MLED's receivers. So that's available um, to support um, correct consumption of that data in OzPos, and that'll happen automatically. And the outcome will be precise coordinates and uh, indication of the positional uncertainty for those uh, coordinates um, from Geoscience Australia. Once again, a free tool. And finally, um, uh, MLED hardware integrates really nicely with external sensors such as ground penetrating radars, um, bathymetry sensors, um, machine guidance for tractors, drones and robots, um, autonomous tractors. We have a couple of autonomous tractor manufacturers here in Australia integrating MLED as their default uh, GNSS uh, solution provider. And that position can be shared over a serial cable, TCP and Bluetooth. So I just want to uh, end the death by PowerPoint now and um, remind everyone that this webinar is being recorded. Um, we're shortly going to bounce into Q&A and um, give everyone an opportunity to ask some questions via chat. Um, before we do that, however, I'd like to um, extend to everyone an opportunity to get access to some Emlet hardware before you have to purchase it with free demos. So we normally offer that as a rental service, but for um, today's viewers of the webinar, we are extending an offer with uh, three days access to Emlet hardware for free, and we'll cover the postage to get it uh, to and from you. Um, and if you're interested in that, um, we'll send out an email um, uh, so that you can connect with one of our team, Brad. And I think that our team's going to pop uh, Brad's contact details into the, the chat uh, for today's um, uh, webinar, and we'll also email those out to you. We'd like to extend an invitation to you to join our next webinar 
on uh, November the 21st at the same time, 4 p.m. And in that webinar, we're going to do a deep dive into the different MLEG receivers on the market and help you to understand the ins and outs of each of the different receivers so that you can make a well-informed choice about what receivers are of interest to you. You're also welcome to get in touch with Brad if you'd like to take 30 minutes of his time to just discuss what your business requirements are and what you're thinking. And, and Brad can you know, help you um, understand where things are at on a one-to-one -one basis. So please feel free to get in touch with Brad for that. Finally, this is our first webinar. As I pointed out, you know, I'm feeling a bit calmer now than I was at the beginning, um, but we depend on your feedback to continually improve. We're an ISO accredited company for quality and we do have um, opportunities for improvement uh, as, a, as a big focus in our business. And we're really interested in hearing your feedback. So if you've got ideas on how we can make these things better, please let us know. Um, so now here's your chance to hang around for the Q&A. But before you do, let's announce the winners of today's prize draw. We've got a couple of prize packs to give away and the media team have been looking at who's online. You've got to be online to win it. And uh, they're going to, they've got a random number generator. Don't ask me how. Um, I think it's got something to do with some plugin for Google Sheet. And shortly, I think they're going to publish into the chat uh, who the webinar uh, winners are. Actually, random from all members, first winner, if present, is, drum roll, Luke Carmichael. Uh, so, Luke, are you on, are you, I see we've got a Luke. If that's Luke Carmichael, um, unmute yourself and let us know, mate. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. Awesome. Congratulations, Luke. Um, so, the team will get in touch with you after the event and um, uh, make arrangements to send you out your, your prize pack. And we've got another prize pack to give away. Uh, so let's see, oh, Florencia Tulida. Florencia Tulida. Have we got Florencia online today? I can't see Florencia's name amongst the list. I think it might have to go to a redraw. Everyone loves a redraw. Oh, Neil Britton. We got Neil on board. Hey, hey yeah, Neil! Board. Congratulations, mate! You picked yourself Thank up you. a Mango's mapping backpack, t-shirt, coffee mug, and a couple of pens. That's great. Um, so, congratulations to all of our winners. Um, we're now going to open the chat to uh, all of our guests in today's webinar, and um, please, um, yeah, we encourage you to. Um, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Um, please feel free to. Um, Ask us any any information you'd like to know. Uh, we've got no questions. Oh, here we go. Would a DJI Mavic Pro carry a GNSS module? So um, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a non-trivial answer. Igor, do you want to respond to that? Um, well, I think maybe you're a uh, kind of the DJI expert, uh, but I would say that uh, if we're talking about you know picking the right drone. Um, maybe your first drone for uh, for drone mapping and something that will play uh, nicely with the rs two pluses. So I think the Mavic three e enterprise is the is the default choice right now or the uh, or the p four pro RTK depending on your requirements in terms of uh, autonomy. Uh, but I would say, yeah, the Mavic three e enterprise is is the way to go. Uh, Al, do you remember if it comes with an RTK module or it is, an, is it an add-on uh, an add on, on top of the three? Yeah, it's an add-on. So, <clears throat> um, so uh, for DJ on Mavic Pro, like um, there are, I think, some people that are doing, um, you know, slightly hacky solutions to allow um, non-RTK drones to carry a GNSS module as an external payload and use, you know, LED light um, sensors to trigger photo events uh, as logs in the GNSS log. However, um, uh, ev every uh, instance of those that we've been aware of has been, um, you know, uh, not entirely smooth sailing and it's certainly not something that we recommend to our users. We, we tend to steer our customers away from those solutions. And if you've got a DJI Mavic Pro and that's what you're using for your uh, aerial surveys and that's what you want to continue to use, then we would encourage you to, um, you know, to invest in lay the time in laying out ground control um, points and quality checkpoints um, to do that photogrammetry with uh, control inside your imagery. 
Um, we've got a second question around how to load and where to load background imagery for MWID flow. So with MWID flow, there's a survey upgrade that allows some extended um, capabilities, including bringing in uh, a customized imagery backdrop. So the easiest way to do that, um, from my own experience, is using Mapbox. So with Mapbox, there's a uh, the capability to create a free account and to upload some imagery and to effectively broadcast that imagery as a web map service that you can then consume back in MWID Flow. Um, if you're interested in that, there is a blog article on the MWID website, on the MWID blog, uh, or the community forum. I can't remember where it is. It might be in the community forum, but there is uh, certainly some um, detailed information there uh, to support that understanding. If you'd like to know more, please get back in touch with us personally and we'll steer you in the right direction. Oh, so many questions now. Um, is there a limit to how quickly a Reach M2 can receive and process camera hot shoe triggers in drone survey applications? Igor, this one's for you. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I've been trying to come up with an answer for that. Uh, so um, we haven't really uh, um, kind of seen this limit. So I think any reasonable rate from, from a camera works. So uh, I think it's very uncommon to trigger more than once a second. Uh, and so I think it depends on your application. And if you really need a uh, really high um, frame rate per second, then uh, this needs to be explored in more detail and, and tested in more detail. Um, but overall, I think up to maybe 200 milliseconds, we should be good. Right, so yeah. like five times, five times or per second. Yep, thank you, five hertz, yep. Uh, so we've got the next question from James Mancy. I work in the water, water monitoring space, looking at some cost-effective DGPS gear. Sort of accuracy I could get from Oscores versus a subscription service like SmartNet, advantages of both. <clears throat> Sorry, James. Um, so just declaring our perceived conflict of interest, Mango's Mapping is a uh, SmartNet reseller, but we're also a strong proponent of Geoscience Australia's Oscores service. Um, I often struggle to see a difference between the two. The fundamental benefits of SmartNet are that they broadcast corrections in non-GDA 2020, and they allow you to access a VRS service, not just a nearest base service. So depending on the distribution of um, mount points or base stations for Oscores in Tasmania, um, you know, you might find that your baselines are getting extended and you'd like to sit inside a triangle of stations. I'm not too sure of the geography of all of the reference stations down there. And SmartNet obviously has a bunch of web-based tools that sit outside of the delivery of uh, real-time corrections as well that are uh, accessible as part of that subscription. But in terms of um, cheap and cheerful, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Oscores. I rate it. It's free. It's accessible. They've just more than doubled the amount of base stations that they've got. They're up over 400, I think 470 reference stations now and on their way to 700. I believe that's the Positioning Australia goal. Uh, Luke, is there a possibility that MLED Flow 360 will allow for measuring curves in the future? Um, Igor, are you going to you going to lift the hood and let us look into the future of MLED? Uh Yeah, we're definitely exploring, you know, all the ways how we can improve our software. So MLED Flow 360 is actually our um, the cloud service uh, where you can um, access your field data within like instant sync the same way that you would access a Google Doc at the same time on your phone and um, uh, and from your browser. Um, and we, we are looking into measuring curves, but this is not on like on the immediate roadmap. So we have uh, we have other uh, priorities right now, but we're definitely looking uh, into such opportunities for the future. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Anthony, when using base rover setup, if you don't know, if you don't have a known point, how much accuracy does the average method give you? E.g. letting the base take readings over a length of time. Look, um, I think that's a bit of a bit of a vexed question. It really comes down to are you averaging a single position or are you averaging a fix? Are you receiving corrections from somewhere and creating a coordinated mark on site that you can come back to? so that you've got longitudinal precision, so that you're using a, a, a short baseline and the same reference mark each time you go back to survey that, um, or are you going to uh, you know, accumulate um, average position on uh, a single observations, which are effectively uncorrected and can vary um, significantly really, especially um, in um, hostile environments where there might be the potential for multipathing. 
I don't think there's a simple answer there, but we're happy to take that up with you on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you have a specific use case and want to discuss it in further detail. Denise, why purchase cause service when Auscause is free? I hope I've sort of touched on some of the value propositions of what a cause service will deliver in terms of being able to operate in GDA 94 as well as GDA 2020 and have access to VRS versus nearest base and some of the online non-RTK related tools that come with the SmartNet service. Um, Patrick is setting up the codes for utility mapping purposes and easy process. Um, I, I know the answer to that, but I, I'm going to let Igor talk. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's very easy. You just need to upload the, your list of codes to Amlet All360, and it's immediately available on your on your mobile phone. Uh, and yeah, that's it, as easy as it gets, I would say. And then you can also add codes on the fly in the field if you um, if you find that you forgot something from your library. So yeah, it's 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 very easy. Yeah. Now, um, Andrew's asked a fairly wide question in terms of what about the Amlet app? Can we share more details on that? So. Um, in one minute or less, Igor, what would you like to tell us about the um, Emlet app? Um, all right, so the Emlet uh, app is called Emlet Flow. It's available for Android and iOS. It uh, allows for both for data collection and for setouts. It supports all sorts of coordinate systems, so everything you might want to use in Australia is covered, uh, and we have properly tested that uh, many times over. Uh, it allows connection to NTRIP sources. Um, in terms of the data collection, uh, I will also now have localization routines for construction where you would create your own co coordinate system from uh, from known points on site. We can do base shifts, um, coded data collection, lines, um, as well as lines takeouts. Um, and like the, the main beauty of uh, Family Flow is like, one is that it's available for iOS unlike many other apps. Um, and the other is that it's all uh, immediately synchronized into your account if you choose to do so. And then uh, your data is available uh, instantly in the browser. So you can easily access that in the office on the big screen and it's available between all of your devices. Uh, so this is kind of the how how we see the future of, uh, of service software. And that's where the direction in which we are building uh, Amlet Flow. Uh, it might not have all the capabilities uh, right now, but we are expanding them uh, every month with new, with new software releases. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. Yeah. There what are the things come. that um, I often point out to our customers or potential customers is that when you buy Emlet hardware and you're using the free app, there are no, you know, like your total total lifetime cost for the receiver is is your capital expense up front. So, you know, you buy the receiver, the firmware updates for that receiver are published for free for the life of the product until it's deprecated, right? So you're not paying X percent per annum to access firmware updates. Um, all of the features of the receiver are unlocked. If you decide later on that you want to access NTRIP or log static, you're not going to pay, you know, 1600 bucks to unlock that feature. That feature is already exposed as part of the product. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make that um, uh, point. Um, we had another question from James, but I'm not too sure where we're going here. Oh yeah, so the DJI Mavic Pro is best used with a DJI GPS unit on its back. And Emlet transmits corrections through the drones controller at the operator end. So yeah, that's correct when you're doing RTK. And if you're doing PPK, you have the drone log its Rhinex and you're collecting Rhinex from an Emlet receiver and they don't necessarily have to communicate in real time. So for my company, we choose that PPK process for all of the drone surveys that we do, even though we have the opportunity to do RTK we PPK process all of our jobs because we believe it offers us greater precision. Um, Sam, Emlet Caster Pro, is our RS2 Plus able to send RTCM3 MSM4 data to the caster, then change the data to stream as RTM 3.1 legacy as one mount point and MSM4 as a second mount point? I don't believe so. Igor, did you want to just clarify that for me? Uh, yeah, that's not something that we can do at the moment. I think the kind of, uh, maybe the, the background to this question is that, uh, you might want to have this like legacy messages for, uh, things like agricultural equipment, if you're not ready to consume MSM4, 
what we found is that uh, sometimes it's okay to just send both through the same mount point. It obviously depends on the end device you're using, but sometimes you can just try and select all the MSM messages and also the legacy messages, and then the equipment will just kind of pick up the messages it needs. And again, uh, this requires testing. Yep. Um, Ben's asked what devices are suggested to use as controllers with the RX and RS2+. Plus. Um, I don't think we get too prescriptive with the devices, but I tend to encourage my users not to go for the cheapest phone on the market. You actually want a phone that's got some reasonable processing power. Your phone is going to do a little bit of heavy lifting when it's working with the AMOLED gear. Um, so you'll have a better experience if you're using a, you know, a more competent phone. Yeah, uh, or an iPhone. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, any iPhone. With a big screen, yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the solution? Yeah, but I have had some customers with like, you know, $100 Androids um, struggle a bit with the... With the, the yeah, device. yeah. That happens, um, that happens. Mm. What is the solution to the problem of 3G networks being deprecated and the user has an AMLED RS2 that only has a 3G modem in it? Igor? Um, yeah, so what we're going to do with it is... So uh, first of all, the modem has uh, 2G fallback and the 2G networks uh, are... Uh, they will get deprecated eventually, but they are uh, here to stay for longer, uh, for longer than uh, the 3G networks. And our solution here is um, we are already rolling this out as a beta, uh, but we're going to roll, out, roll this out until the end of the year, uh, the ability to send corrections through your uh, mobile phone to the RS2, and this way, like leveraging the, the cellular modem inside your phone to then transmit those corrections uh, via Bluetooth connection to uh, to the RS2. You can already try this today. We have the instructions on our community forum, but keep in mind, this is kind of better functionality, which we are uh, testing and ironing out all the bugs now. And until in the end of the year, we should release a full uh, production version and actually uh, switch our customers to working uh, over uh, Bluetooth if they choose to do so and having uh, this capability of receiving corrections through their mobile device. Awesome. Now we do have this session scheduled to um, finish in three minutes, two minutes. So if uh, everything just cuts out in a couple of minutes, um, everyone knows why this is our first webinar. So we don't know what happens at 5.05, but we're all about to find out. Um, now there's a, just very quickly, um, what's the limit for how many points a single project can hold? Uh, I think now it's about 20,000, uh, which is a limit where, yeah. Yep, that'll do. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the interest of brevity, um, someone had a sales rep for another GNSS supplier. Tell them that the hardware being used in your receiver is an automotive board rather yeah. than survey quality. Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, so there is a lot of smoke and mirrors in the industry, especially the survey grade things. Um, and uh, it's all just... Uh, pretty much marketing um, definitions of things like electronics doesn't know that it's survey or automotive. Uh, it just works or it doesn't. So I would say just like believe the accuracy tests uh, of our users uh, rather than the sales pitch. So for some people we hear, obviously people in the industry are very unhappy about us. So there will be a lot of nonsense being thrown around, like uh, all the things, you know, that are not proper with our equipment. But I think the experience of our users really, um, uh, speaks here yeah it speaks for yeah. itself um yeah. yeah and and i can vouch for that i mean i became an emlet dealer because i was looking for an affordable solution um at the time emlet were um taking pre-orders for equipment they weren't yet delivering um there was no guarantee it would work but looking at the history of their other products i took a gamble within a week i'd gone and occupied some benchmarks saw the precision and that was with a single frequency l1 only receiver i couldn't believe what i was getting and and began my relationship with emlet as a result that same person also asked um are there any plans to enable tilt um with the imu because there there is some discussion about the imu that's embedded within the existing products but i believe that's not used for tilt uh yeah it's not used for tilt and the quality of the imu in terms of the precision uh of the unit inside the stability of the unit which is inside the rs2 is not suitable for um, doing tilt compensation. Um, we have more designed it for to enable some uh, better user experience, like to understanding if the receiver is tipped over, but not not, not precision work, I would say. Um, okay. So, yeah. Yep. And then uh, last question, I think from Ray, 
I have a question on the M2. We have an M2 in a boat. It runs a bit warm. Just wondering if there were plans to have the M2 run cooler. Uh, so we're constantly optimizing the software and reducing the kind of CPU loads and things like that. So over time, it might start to run cooler. But overall, M2 is a drone design where we kind of expect it to have some airflow. So uh, I understand it's more challenging in the boat, um, but it is what it is. Got it. Okay, well, it looks like we've managed to address all of the questions that are uh, in today's uh, webinar. Thanks very much, everyone, for joining. It's been a bunch of fun. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to, to join us on this webinar. We'd love to see you on the next one. Keep an eye out in your inbox for our emails and congratulations to our winners today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thanks for joining us, Igor. See you later. Oh, wait, two new messages, three new messages. Oh, they're all just saying thanks. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ah, you're welcome, Graham. I recognize that voice anywhere. <laughs>